This is a technical review of the Morningstar TriStar TSMPPT60 solar charge controller. And before we start, there are a couple of disclaimers. Number one is this is my own personal unit. It has not been sponsored by anyone or any entity. I've paid my, my own hard-earned money for it and I intend to use it after this review. So there are going to be no destructive or potentially destru destructive tests performed on it which would go outside of its bounds of use. The second disclaimer is that this controller supports batteries up to 48 volts nominal which can go up to 60 volts during equalization charging and is capable of surviving up to 72 volts on the input. It also connects to up to 150 volt peak solar panels, which means that this device connects to not only one, but two separate, potentially dangerous, high energy systems. If you short out a car battery, it isn't a huge deal, but if you short out four car batteries, you have the potential of unleashing four times, or even more than four times, as much energy. <laughs> and that can be incredibly dangerous and it's uh, very easy to get confused so it's only 48 volts DC that is, that's not dangerous it's barely even going to give you a tickle if you've got sweaty hands but one wrong move and you could have a serious situation going on and of course 150 volt DC solar panel that's dangerous even to touch so keep that in mind if you're going to purchase one of these units you are responsible for your own safety now, with that out of the way, let's move on. Let's run through the test setup we're going to use for this review. On the left we've got the charge controller itself, which is connected using all the available connections you get in the box. It's got the remote temperature sensor connected, which is placed on top of the batteries. It's got the remote battery sensing connected through a twisted pair cable. It's of course got the battery connected and some solar panel circuits connected. It's also got uh, going to get uh, a fair bit of meters and oscilloscopes attached to it whenever we see fit. But the unit should be used to essentially the extent of its capabilities. To the right we've got uh, a high voltage power supply which can do 75 volts at 4 amps or 150 volts at 2 amps which is going to be the high voltage panel surrogate and of course it's only a 300 watt power supply so that can't be used to test the unit to its uh, full potential but it can give us an idea about its voltage regulation at higher voltages so to come top of it is of course just the basic DSO in front of those things we've also got a 1 ohm resistor which is going to be connected in series for the high voltage supply in order to smooth out the current limit a bit because this supply is just a bit unnecessarily quick with that, it doesn't behave like a solar panel. However, with a resistor in series, it's good enough. Beyond, below that, we've got a 60 amp battery breaker and a banana plug extension box. Further still, we've got our main meters, which is a Bryman BM189 current clamp meter and a BM869 50,000 count uh, multimeter. Now, I will be using the clamp meter to measure current for the most part since uh, the Bryman only goes up to 10 amps on the current range and intrusive current measurements are a bit clumsy. So some of our measurements are going to be subject to the inaccuracies of a clamp meter but that's the only tool I've got available. Behind that we've got uh, just a laptop running the software that ships with the unit which we're going to take a look at and down to the right we've got two 14 volt uh, rather variable but 14 ish volt set uh, 44 amp power supplies which are going to act as our low current uh, low voltage high current solar panel surrogate and these power supplies are when hooked up in series able to max out the unit so we can do some tests to the limit of this unit, its capabilities uh, in a 12 volt system, which we are going to do. And to the left of that we've got four AGM batteries, 
these are hardly new they are about 60 amp hours in each and they are of course hooked up in series but I can tap off 12, 24, 36 or 48 volts as I see fit the battery connectors we're using are just two screw terminal blocks which have the main input of the charge controller connected through the thick white wires the sense wires connected the little white and orange wire as well as the load wire which is the black and red wires which are going to this the switchable 4 or 8 ohm power resistor which can be used to very cleanly load down the batteries however it can only perform a, a very limited amount of power at lower voltages so for high power loading at the low voltage we've got a 1000 watt inverter which uh, can load the batteries down with uh, about 120 amps but we're going to use it mostly below 100 amps just to get the battery loaded down enough to max out the charging circuit of the solar charge controller and that's pretty much it as far as the testing setup is concerned and here's a look at the connections inside of the unit itself on the far left we've got our solar input which is just to terminate to a banana plug and running through a 4 square millimeter wire to the banana splitting box to the right of that we've got our solar ground which does the same thing and to the right of that we've got our battery ground which is running through a 6 to 8 something along those lines a square millimeter cable then directly to the negative of the battery then we've got our reset switch and the sense wire connection this one is running straight to the battery terminals and uh, it's of course the connection that monitors the actual battery voltage since uh, there's going to be considerable voltage drop in the actual battery cables below those we have our RS232 serial connector which is running to the PC as well as a RG45 standard Ethernet connector which is running to my home network to the right of that we've got uh, our status LEDs green, yellow and red and to the right of that we have our remote temperature sensor connection and furthest to the right we have our battery positive which uh, is again a 6 to 8 square millimeter cable and it's also got a banana jack crammed into it in order to provide some monitoring of the direct uh, battery voltage at the unit we need to do this in order to uh, have a look at the ripple and noise and uh, regulation accuracy and stuff like that and at the time of testing the unit is running the newest available firmware which is uh, controller firmware 1.01.22 and networking firmware or B firmware 9.25 now starting off the actual review we'll have a look at the manual or rather we won't because I can just tell you that this is a very very good manual you do get a nice high quality printed manual shipped with a unit and it contains all the information you could ever wish to know about these units it comes with safety instructions how to hook it up it tells you how to configure the unit gives you charts animations well not animation but you get the idea it's overall a very very nice manual you even get efficiency curves which we will be testing the truth content of I have very little doubt that they would lie about these given the very high quality of the basically everything I've seen about it thus far however there is one glaring problem with this manual and that is the voltage, battery voltage specification. I have not been able to make my unit work on 36 volts. And they seem to go back and forth about the 36 volt thing because the, it has no specified maximum output power for 36 volts and basically 36 volts is mentioned in one or two places in the manual. Now, it is obviously just a software issue since uh, 
the device very obviously can handle any voltage from 12 through 48 volts nominal DC so I'm not sure why 36 volts isn't working there's no dip switch configuration setting which would enable it to run on 36 volts so you're all if you want to use 36 volts you're limited to the automatic voltage detection but that does on my unit detect uh, the battery as a 48 volt battery and it doesn't seem to realize that it's actually having a 36 volt battery so it basically just sits there and overcharges the crap out of the battery which obviously isn't going to work for very long at all so keep that in mind I have not contacted this morning story about this I do not know if there's any fix but general digging around on the internet has yielded nothing moving on from that specification however we have our maximum voltages and our maximum powers which basically are just uh, multiplications of the system voltage and the output current we also have some specifications for voltage regulation and uh, an idle power consumption or self power consumption figure which we will be testing as well we get the default setting for temperature compensation which can be customized through software as can the temperature compensation range and all of the battery voltages however you get do get a very sensibly configured pre-configured battery voltage uh, settings most of these sealed ones are what I would say very sensible and would give you a very good general starting point for uh, whatever battery type you're using however I of course recommend if you are using any kind of reasonably high class batteries you are going to get specifications from the battery manufacturer and you should always if you are able to use the custom settings and configure your charge control to charge according to your battery manufacturer specifications we also get a couple of derating curves for the unit this is the uh, array voltage versus uh, output uh, current derating curve and something to note about it is that if your panel voltage is above 140 volts, the unit is going to throttle the output uh, until it reaches zero at 150 volts. So that is something to keep in mind. You need to keep your array voltage below 140 volts, else you are going to run into issues where your array is uh, sitting in full sunlight, giving you whatever voltage it's capable of, but you aren't going to harvest the entire amount of power it can provide. We also have a heatsink temperature versus output current derating curve and the heatsink should be kept below 80 degrees celsius before throttling begins it certainly isn't going to be a problem for me here in cold Finland what's more interesting though is that we get these efficiency curves for the unit at different voltages and uh, basically we get, we get the trend that uh, the lower the voltage differential from input to output the more efficient the unit is going to be. At a 12 volt system rated at uh, a battery voltage of 12.8 volts, the unit peaks at a 98% efficiency with a 13 volt panel. So obviously the unit is just basically going to connect the panel straight through to the battery in such a case, which uh, we will see that it actually does efficiency at a very high voltage panel and a very low battery voltage however is not entirely great it's basically between 92 and 93 percent but uh, such a used scenario is a bit unusual I don't see why you would run such a high voltage panel at such a low voltage battery since you are limited to about 600 watts either way the efficiency at uh, 24 volts is uh, slightly higher moving down as you go up in the panel voltages the 48 volt specification however is uh, a bit more impressive where we have actually we are breaching 99 percent efficiency at a low panel voltage and we are basically at any considerable amount of power above 97 percent efficiency this unit clearly is uh, built uh, in order to facilitate 48 volt systems above others and of course it's easier to get better efficiency at a higher voltage that's uh, always the case with 
low voltage DC and as because of that it of course makes sense to run this unit at the highest possible battery bank voltage that you can you are going to get it rated for up to 3 kilowatts at 48 volts whereas it's derated at the lower voltages moving on to the actual measurements of the unit uh, we'll start off with idle power consumption which is uh, currently at uh, roughly 2.2 watts while being connected to both Ethernet and serial at the same time and uh, continuously providing data to both. If we disconnect the Ethernet cable, the power consumption drops considerably to roughly 1.5 watts. So, power consumption certainly falls within the specification at 12 volts. And at 24 volts, we have 2.2 watts with Ethernet and 1.5 watts without. And at 48 volts we have 2.35 watts with Ethernet and 1.66 without. Moving on to the efficiency tests, uh, the setup is this. I've got uh, the battery under a considerable load, about 45 amps, which is pulling its voltage down. And this cheap meter over here, which is uh, accurate enough, is measuring the battery voltage at the Morningstar regulator's battery terminals. The Bryman meter, the BM869, is measuring the panel input voltage of the Morningstar controller and uh, the clamp meter is measuring the solar parent panel current and the battery current and I of course need to move that around in order to take the measurements and I need to be very fast about it but it's accurate enough, this is only a review. So I've currently got it set up to roughly mimic a 16.5 volt maximum power point panel using the two big power supplies under the bench and I've got it hooked up to a 12 volt, ba volt battery obviously so this is the first scenario we're going to test and uh, I've already taken the measurement but I'm just going to show you the setup so you see that I'm not just lying to you so now I'm going to hook up the panel by plugging the banana plug into the power supplies and it's going to take a little while for the controller to find the maximum power point of the so-called solar panel and there we go it did a sweep and found that the panel is roughly at 16.5 volts at 4 to 2 amps so let's check the battery current 51.1 amps now, that's for rough data. I already did the calculations and I need to be quick about this since my cables aren't really adequate for hooking up a panel this thick since I'm just using 4 square millimeter wires, something's going to catch fire. Either way, the measurement I did under somewhat more controlled circumstances gave us an input power of 690 watts, an output power of 657.8 watts and a combined efficiency of 95.3% which if we look at the efficiency chart correlates quite well with the quoted efficiency which at around 700 watts is eh, about 95.7 or 8 somewhere around that and 95.3 uh, that's certainly within our margin of error Okay, so using that technique, I've collected a total of 15 data points about the efficiency of uh, this unit. And uh, right away I can report that uh, they seem to correlate quite well with the quoted specifications, sometimes even exceeding them considerably. Well, within the context of a couple of percent anyway. So, at the uh, 12 volt uh, battery setup. I first tested at 16.5 volts at 657 watts. It didn't quite live up to the specified efficiency there but the tolerances for this measurement are quite large since I'm not really very well equipped to measure low panel voltages at these high currents so I would say that this is certainly acceptable. I also did a test at 28 volts per mole panel voltage which isn't specified but uh, it seems to be uh, a bit more efficient than you would expect since uh, the lower, higher the panel voltage you go the lower the efficiency gets however 
the 28 volt panel voltage seems to be at a higher efficiency than the 16.5 volts since it's basically following that curve so that kind of points toward uh, my measurements on the lower panel voltage being inaccurate either way at the roughly 66 volt uh, panel voltage it co coincides perfectly correlates perfectly with the specified efficiency and the 98 volt uh, system pretty much does that as well. I also did a test at 117 volts maximum uh, power point panel voltage uh, which is not specified however it seems to roughly make sense considering the general trend of these curves. Now I should point out that I have not managed to get my controller to work very well with panel voltages above about 120 volts. Uh, it'll usually end up uh, thinking the power point is around 120 volts even though it would be closer to 150. Now this could be due to the fact that uh, I only have a 300 watt power supply that's able to supply such a high voltage and I can't make a statement on whether or not uh, it'll actually work better at higher voltages at how higher power levels. Moving on to the 24 volt efficiency, the inadequacies of my testing power supply becomes uh, more obvious since uh, I was only able to use the big power supplies for one measurement at uh, roughly 725 watts. However, at that power level, it uh, performed exactly as you would expect at 98 point something percent efficiency. Basically, all of the other measurements uh, line up perfectly with the specification and even the high panel voltage, 116-ish volts, uh, lines up with the 98 volt uh, specification, so it performs surprisingly efficient at a high panel voltage in this application. You would expect it to be mm, just slightly lower. Now, at the 48 volt battery voltage, uh, my measurements are basically meaningless, since we're only measuring right at the absolute lowest uh, power level this uh, controller specified as uh, having any kind of performance at. However, the measurements I have been able to take uh, are fairly positive. The 52 volt maximum power point voltage uh, performs basically at the specified level slightly below, but that's within our tolerances. The 66 volt is slightly above, again within our tolerances. The 81 volt uh, panel voltage uh, performs quite a bit better than the specified efficiency. <laughs> Look, it's supposed to be down somewhere around 92.5%, but it's uh, over 95. And I believe there was a note in one of the firmware updates that uh, said that it addressed low power efficiency. So that might have something to do with it. The same is true for the 98 volt panel voltage, uh, which is a bit better than its specification. This is the 98 volt curve, this is our 98 volt point. And the 109 volt maximum power point voltage, which was the highest voltage I was able to get the controller to regulate at with a 48 volt uh, pack. Anything above of this and it would uh, go into current limiting. Uh, but it basically correlates to the 98 volt graph, which is uh, considerably better than you would expect it to do. You would expect that point to be somewhere right down here for these graphs are to be followed. However, since we are measuring right at the lowest uh, power level of this unit, you can't really expect these curves to be very exact. You basically just get these roll-off roll curves in order to say, hey, the controller is supposed to be hooked up to a bigger b panel bank than you have here. And uh, these scenarios are basically just for very cloudy days and stuff like that. But uh, Going from the tests I've done, there's a fair amount that I haven't even documented properly because it's just been a bit off the cuff. Uh, I would say that I'm rather confident in believing the specification issues that you are given in the manual. I was fairly certain that uh, the unit would uh, indeed live up to its uh, efficiency specifications due to how detailed they are, giving you actual curves. However, I also felt that it was important to actually try and put them to the test so that uh, they don't just try to trick you by giving you supposedly accurate results while actually having some uh, nasty stuff up their sleeves doing the measurements very improperly or something like that in order to boost their numbers. However, that does not seem to be the case and Morningstar seem to be specifying their units appropriately. 
which uh, is a very good thing. A noteworthy feature of the MPPT tracking algorithm of this unit is that it at very low panel voltages can uh, enter a mode where it operates at a very very low dropout voltage. What we're measuring on the meter right now is the voltage differential between the solar panel input and the battery terminal. And as you can see it's only 0.23 volts. And uh, even if we turn the current up, it's currently set to 100 milliamps, it'll stay in this mode up to several amps as long as the panel voltage is low. We saw it doing a sweep, but it realized that the panel voltage, which is limited to about 52 volts, uh, never went uh, high enough to actually allow it to enter the normal MPPT tracking mode. However, if we actually turn the voltage up high enough, it'll enter MPPT tracking mode, which it seems to do somewhere between 1 and 2 volts of dropout. And the voltage regulation accuracy is specified at 0.1% plus minus 50 millivolts for 4 for 12 and 24 volt systems and 0.1% plus minus 100 millivolts for 48 volt systems and I've calculated the tolerances for that for practical voltages 14, 28 and 56 volts which gives us a total voltage variation of 0.057 volts plus or minus for 14 volt systems plus or minus 0 0.062 volts for 24 volt systems and plus or minus 128 millivolts for 48 volt systems and uh, currently testing a 14 volt regulation set point it certainly falls well within spec it will also fall within spec at 14.5 volts 28 volts 29 volts 56 volts and 58 volts. As for the output noise of the unit, at 58 amps and 13.7 volts, uh, we have roughly 700 millivolts at uh, uh, about 8 megahertz. And it's putting it out in short bursts. This measurement is filtered between 400 hertz and 20 megahertz. Since there is an inverter connected as a load, which is putting a lot of low frequency rubbish on the line and I find it to be quite unlikely for this unit to be putting out some uh, noise which would be that low in frequency the noise seems to be coming out in bursts of uh, about once every 8.4 microseconds or at a frequency of about 119 kilohertz so it's reasonable to assume that that's roughly the switching frequency of this unit as for load decreases, so does the ripple at uh, about 30 amps. We are registering roughly 500 millivolts of ripple at the same frequency. And at a battery voltage of 52 volts and a current of about 5 amps, we are getting bursts of noise at roughly 40 kilohertz and 700 millivolts. So clearly the noise voltage scales up with the battery voltage, which is exactly what you would expect. The main piece of software you'll use for this unit is called MSView, and uh, as you can see, it's a rather basic looking piece of software which I find to be very attractive. It doesn't try to be something fancy, web 2.0, social media enabled thing, but rather it's just a piece of industrial software you use to connect to a particular device in order to configure it. When you first get it started you are basically just presented with uh, a an empty space but uh, it's pretty easy to get started and I've set up an example workspace where I've configured a few information displays and a data logger. Now this unit, this piece of software also supports live graphing of data from the controller however uh, one of the bugs in this program, which there uh, sadly are a few of, is that you can't have a workspace saved with a data logger enabled because it will just crash when you try to connect to, connect to the controller. 
However, we can connect now and manually add our graphing display. This is going through the serial interface, by the way. And we are immediately presented with a whole heap of live data. The historical graphing function is uh, very useful and uh, it will present you with uh, a pretty basic auto-scaling graph of whatever data you wish to put into it. This uh, graph currently just plots the input power over roughly a day and as you can see my panels aren't exactly in the most uh, well thought out place since it's dipping right there as a shadow passes by them. You can also drag several things to the same graph but uh, it won't really auto-arrange to different things so the battery voltage is basically just a flat line there even though it's varying quite a bit in the context of the battery voltage and if we draw the battery current there well <laughs> you can see even less of a difference since it's just sitting around zero in comparison to the input power which is peaking at somewhere around 400. Now there is a considerable bug in the data logging and graphing piece of this software and I'll see if I can show it to you. Yes, this is... Uh, this happens sometimes. The data logger will for some reason log a ridiculous spike in at least the input power. I'm not sure if it does it in other things as well which basically makes the entire graph unusable since it's uh, just auto-arranging it. And I mean my two, my 500 watt array has not put out 3 kilowatts of power for a fraction of a second there. This is clearly just an error. Now you can open up the CSV files and manually find and remove these bugs and if you are proficient with Microsoft Excel or something of the likes you can probably do it quite easily but uh, to the average simple user this is a problem since uh, unless you edit the file your entire log file which could span several days or weeks uh, becomes entirely unusable and these f uh, artifacts can happen several times within a period of time this other log file I just dragged there had two of the same kinds of spikes within a few hours so yeah this software has a few bugs but overall it's useful beyond just displaying data you do get some uh, options for controlling the unit directly where you can just do basic things like disconnect the charger for service or clear various counters and test the email notifications you can also pull some network information out of a unit. Beyond that you also get a few quite useful uh, setup guides for different controllers. This is the dip switch wizard which will help you set up uh, the dip switches inside of your unit. So let's set up our for charging, 24 volts, that voltage setting right there. Uh, now we want manual equalization and whatever that is. And now we get to uh, a nice little graphic which tells us how to set our dip switches. This of course is done through manually setting the switches inside of a unit. You can't uh, adjust these particular settings through software. What's a bit more interesting though is the setup wizard which uh, after throwing some warnings at you allows you to essentially configure everything that can be configured about your unit you can uh, this particular TSMPPT60 can set be set up as a solar or a wind charger, and you can set uh, the absorption voltage. You can set the absorption time. You can set the, the absorption extension parameters. In which case, the which means that if the voltage of your battery drops below a certain threshold the previous day, it'll extend the absorption time in order to account for the deeper discharge of a battery. You can also manually configure your temperature compensation settings, which is very useful if you're using uh, higher end batteries where you actually get some specifications for how to temperature compensate your batteries. I've configured this to 0.3 volts per degree C according to the datasheet of my batteries. And you can also enable or disable the battery service reminder, which I believe can send you an email or just flash a couple of LEDs on the controller 
at a set amount of time. You can also adjust your flute voltage settings. You can also set the flute timeout counter, which uh, basically means that uh, if your system is loaded down so hard that the solar panels can't maintain the flute voltage for a total of this amount of time, the controller will return to uh, bulk charging mode which was I believe 14.10 volts as we set it up uh, in the last screen in order to pr help prevent a deep discharge so once you get enough solar power to actually charge your batteries again it won't go to 13.5 volts but it'll go to 14.10 and the float cancel voltage means that if the previous day your batteries were discharged below this voltage uh, the controller will simply cancel float charging the next day in order to prevent deep discharging. You can of course disable those things if you wish as well. The same things go for the equalizing stuff. Uh, all of these settings are basically uh, pretty self-explanatory and the help files you get with the program are very in-depth usually. You really don't need much explanation because it's halfway out of the screen, but you get fairly accurate descriptions for all of the settings in the help file, and you also get a very thorough help file in the actual help file, which is bundled with the software. But basically, the settings you get in these guides are very, very thorough. Uh, here you can even set the various voltages that change the front panel LED status LEDs during the course of a day. You can also configure what the date of the unit logs internally as opposed to through the MSView software so that you can log some data without actually having a computer running 24-7. And you can set up email notifications. I haven't played around with any of this because I'm not really interested in it, but the options are there. And once you're done with that guide, you get a nice huge table which tells you your settings and you can choose to save them or write them to the unit or do whatever the bloody hell you wish with them. <laughs> this unit is, this software is very flexible. And just for fun, let's uh, demonstrate a couple of the bugs I've found in this software. The first one is, if you create a workspace and add a historical graph, put some data into it and then save the workspace, close the program and open it again, uh, it'll crash when you connect to the controller. There you go. This is remedied by just removing the historical graph and uh, saving the workspace again, but uh, it seems you need to re-add your graphs every time you start the software. I haven't found any real way to have graphs set up by default in a workspace. Another bug is that if you open up a historical graph, add some data to it, and then choose to close the log file you've opened, the software will basically just flip out and you won't get any data working anywhere. Even stuff live from the controller will... Well, it, this one decided to work now, but it basically it cleared all these state monitors which we had set up. It cleared the logging, all the variables, so yeah, it kind of went to, <laughs> went to shit. But it's a minor bug, you just need to restart the program in order to resolve it. Ah, another bug in the software. While trying to read the data out of my controller, I got some absolutely insane values. Like the regulation set point of 7.52 volts for a 12 volt system and 30 volts for a 48 volt system and 2628 days between equalization and minus 5 volts per degree temperature <laughs> compensation. So... Yeah, this is obviously some kind of error, and I'm not going to try programming these values back into the controller. I'm not sure how I made this bug appear, but yeah, you need to keep an eye on it when you are trying to use this program. Beyond the MSView software, you also get a nice little web browser interface for the unit where you can get uh, live data, the basic stuff, and uh, you can, if you enable the DIP switch for it, change the network settings of the unit through this interface and you can access the internal data log which will display the values you've 
is selected in the DMS View software. I haven't set it up to log a whole lot of stuff and I've been playing around with cutting power and so forth so these values are a bit weird but you do get access to a nice data log and it's supposed to add I believe up to even 90 or 100 or 180 days of stuff so you do get a fair bit of data stored inside the actual unit and you can use the MSView software in order to save data off of a unit. And that basically covers the electrical tests I can perform on this unit, leaving only the mechanicals and box box contents. So, for as for the mechanicals, the entire unit is uh, externally made out of metal. It has a bit of a weird shape on the metal box there. And it has three LEDs, green, yellow and red, as well as a reset slash equalize button available on the front panel. Most of the unit is of course made out of this very large heatsink. There's a grill for ventilation on the top. Information on the sides. And nothing on the bottom. The mounting system on this unit is uh, Quite simple, you have this hanger which you get separate loosely in the box as well as uh, three available screw holes down the bottom, one is covered by a note. You get uh, four screws, uh, wood threaded, which uh, you are supposed to hang the unit on a wall with. Very straightforward indeed. The front cover comes off by undoing four screws in the corners and that's of course, as you saw before, where you do all your connections. Noting that uh, the system is a common negative system, so you can it's more flexible than, for instance, the PCM3012, which is uh, common positive. With this one, you can connect your well, you do connect your battery and solar ground together, as well as your main safety ground, which is connected to the case there. The case, of course, has a fair amount of knockouts where you can route your cables, you can fit pretty much any kind of cable through and there are also two knockouts on the back if you want to do connections internally in whatever surface you're mounting it on. Due to the construction of the unit I can't take it apart very far without risking to damage the unit and void my warranty. However, we can take the top cover off which reveals seven Nishikon KXG series 10,000 hours rated capacitors at 200 volts and 330 microfarads as well as on below those two Nishikon HE series capacitors rated at 10,000 hours but at unknown values. We also have somewhere between 10 and 20 semiconductor devices mounted against a cell pad against the heatsink which uh, me means that this part of the heatsink obviously is the primary part and this part over here is just a bit of an extension there's nothing connected on the other side of it, it just goes above the capacitors uh, the semiconductor devices are pressed up against the sill pad with this uh, metal and plastic uh, bus bar looking thing, there is a metal bar which travels down along the unit there which is then screwed into what I presume to be the heatsink, which is providing fairly evenly distributed pressure against the uh, semiconductors through these plastic uh, extenders. You also have a few 150 degree rated uh, wires, which are of multiconductor type and very, very flexible. I haven't been able to figure out the thickness of them, but I would assume somewhere around uh, 6 square millimeters just, just from the general appearance. We can also see on the networking board or the processor board well I can see I've used a mirror to peek underneath this which uh, did not reveal a whole lot but it did uh, show me that there is some form of uh, microchip processor doing something in it but that was the only thing I could make out. I could not make out the model number of any, or anything like that. And aside from the unit itself, what you get in the box is this. A remote temperature sensor with a very long cord. This seems to be some 
M10-ish or M8 size terminal which you just connect to something close to your batteries. It's supposedly electrically insulated so you might as well just clamp it onto a terminal of the batteries if that's the only place you can mount it, although that would probably not be optimal since that might heat up. You also get a ferrite bead which are supposed to wrap the thermal sensor a couple of laps around and clamp it around in order to reduce electrical interference due to the long cord. You get uh, a four terminal uh, screw connector which is for the RS485 interface the mounting hanger which comes loose and with its large screw four screws for mounting it into some soft material like wood if you're mounting it against metal you need to supply your own screws unless you're fine with using these as self tappers you get uh, a the nice manual in English, a instruction sheet for the remote temperature sensor, quite elaborate that too. You get multilingual manual, which isn't quite as uh, involved as the English one, but uh, it seems to be okay. As well as a small commercial pamphlet lining up Morningstar different products for different price ranges. And that pretty much concludes this review of the Morningstar TriStar MPPT TS MPPT60 Maximum Power Point Tracking 60 Amp Solar Charge Controller. Thank you for watching and if there's any test or measurement or information that I didn't do that you would like to see please leave a comment and at least I can try to get my hands on it for you and post in a comment, if not in a separate video. Cheerio!